What we're going to pick up today is in chapter 21. Um, we're going to talk about image quality um, and what we have to have to have a quality image. Some of the stuff that we're going to touch on in chapter 21 we've already talked about and it will also carry over into chapter 22 of uh, limiting scatter radiation and how we should um, <coughs> improve the image by reducing the scatter. Um, so you need to understand that, that everything that we talked about in the, the last section, chapter 15, um, you know, we're going to review chapter 15 in this section. We're going to review it in the final section as well. So, you know, everything from chapter 15 will be, uh, you know, a portion of the chapter 21 text. So you need to, to make sure that you didn't, don't just flush what we, what we talked about in the last section. So, you know, those questions come back up again. And likewise, on the fourth test, you know, the, the information from the third test would be uh, fair game as well. So uh, make sure you stay in, in review of those and don't just uh, purge the information. And if you don't, you know, if you review back over, it'll, it'll make, make the uh, final exam a little bit easier. And hopefully that will carry forward into the, the sophomore imaging class and um, the summer semester uh, is a complete departure from everything that we've done so far so you know if you stay and review this semester it'll, it should help you um, when we get to sophomore imaging as well so um, so what we're going to talk about is image quality put it up there. So uh, overview of what we're going to do in this particular section is spatial resolution. We're going to talk about spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is actual sharpness or recorded detail um, and we touched on that. We're going to talk about contrast resolution. Um, so uh, what it is that, that truly gives us our contrast but what also we do to reduce the noise so that we clean up some of that scatter radiation. Noise is, scatter radiation is noise. Not all noise is scatter radiation, but all scatter radiation is noise. So we'll talk about the different types of noise. We'll talk about the, the imaging factors. We'll talk about the geometric factors, which are your uh, spatial resolution. We'll talk about the, the subject factors, which we already talked about in the last section, artifacts, and uh, what we can do to improve quality and make sure that we can see what it is that we need to see. So when we're talking about image quality, we're talking, uh, we're, uh, in this context, radiographic quality is image quality and not x-ray beam quality. So when we talk about x-ray beam quality and things that control your x-ray beam, the quality of your x-ray beam, that would be your KVP, your filtration, machine phase, and things like that. So this is what we actually see, how that x-ray beam interacts inside of the patient to give us the, uh, the exposure on the image receptor that we need to see in order to, to make the diagnosis. So it uh, really has a couple of different factor, or, uh, components to it. Um, we need to see accurate representation of the anatomy. We'll go through that in positioning and what we have to have to have that accurate representation. That's the, the relationship between the image receptor, the anatomy, and the x-ray beam. Right? So the, the best representation of that anatomy is going to be a, an image that doesn't show any kind of distortion, be it size distortion or shape distortion. We'll go through that um, later on. So the factors we desire are high spatial resolution. And the reason I put spatial resolution in the parenthesis is because um, when you get to the test, you're, you're going to have a tendency to look at the test questions. You're going to have a tendency to think, well, what kind of, what kind of resolution or, uh, is the question asking me about? So uh, spatial resolution, contrast resolution, two totally different things. Um, and we talked about that in the last section. Spatial resolution, sharpness of recorded detail. Contrast resolution is, can I see it, right? So spatial resolution, um, it, the, the things that you would look for in a test question that's at, that are asking you about spatial resolution would be just that, spatial resolution. Um, sharpness of recorded detail sharpness all by itself or resolution all by itself would all be uh, spatial resolution. Contrast resolution is always going to have that contrast quantifier to it, right? And most of the time it's just going to say contrast, so don't let the resolution throw you off. If it says contrast resolution, that just means contrast, okay? 
And if it doesn't say contrast resolution, then always assume that that's going to be spatial resolution, sharpness required detail. All right. So the things we don't want to see too much of are any kind of noise, be that quantum model of scatter radiation, or it's unrealistic to say any noise because you're always going to have scatter. Um, so we're going to have noise, uh, minimizing that noise, uh, hopefully eliminating quantum model, minimizing the scatter radiation, and then removal of any kind of artifacts that, that we can get rid of. So we're going to camp out quite a bit on contrast, uh, not necessarily on this slide, but throughout the, the slideshow. So contrast, remember we've got two different types of contrast, we've got two different types of density. Contrast just means difference. Every time you see contrast, think difference. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, patient contrast or if it's radiographic contrast. In both cases, it means difference. And it really, in both cases, it means difference in density. Inside of the patient, you've got different tissue types that have different truly atomic numbers uh, in mixture to create a, an effective atomic number. So you got things with uh, high mineral content like bone versus soft tissue, which is a high water content, right? But even within similar tissue types, you've got different densities, packed compactness of the tissue types. So you can see difference, different soft tissues because of that compactness, right? So you can see kidneys. You might be starting to make out kidneys on KB. Uh, you can see the psoas muscles fairly easily. That's, that's usually the first thing that you can pick out as a, as a first year student. You can see the psoas muscles on KUB. Um, even though everything in the abdomen is soft tissue. Of course, you got the spine and the pelvis and all that, but in the abdomen proper, inside the, uh, the abdominal cavity, really what you have is soft tissue, different types of soft tissue. So even though all those soft tissues are water-based, you can still see the difference between them because of the compactness of that stuff. So it's the difference in the tissue type, right? Bone versus soft tissue, muscle versus uh, fat, and then air versus everything else, right? So it's the difference. It's the difference in those tissue types that is your subject contrast. And then we've got radiographic contrast. We have to have subject contrast to give us radiographic contrast. All right, so if everything was identical, and I don't mean just water-based, but everything was identical in compactness and makeup, then everything would look the same. It would have no contrast, All right? We can see radiographic contrast because there are differences in tissue contrast, All right? So you have to have the contrast. You have to have the contrast. It's all radiographic contrast, subject contrast, gives us radiographic contrast. So we have to have the differences in tissue types so that we can see those individual tissues on the, the image. So what controls a radiographic contrast primarily then is the tissue types, so the differential absorption. Differential absorption, uh, we've kind of touched on that in the last section, is absorption levels at different uh, energy levels and also a different tissue in different tissue types, right? Different tissues absorb at a different rate. So we've got differential absorption that give us our subject contrast and that's how we can see radiographic contrast. So difference. Contrast is all about difference, right? Read contrast. What's the word you're thinking? Difference. difference. Always difference, right? It, uh, it, it kind of gives you I don't know, it, it tends to throw you a little bit because it says difference in radiographic density or difference in, in tissue type, tissue density, right? So sometimes your, your definition of contrast will have density inside of it, but it's still contrast, it's still difference. So don't get hung up on density, focus on contrast, contrast means difference, right? So it's difference in, in density. So what your density is, is the overall darkening of the image. Um, I meant to bring up an x-ray, I'll bring one up here in a minute. So density is how dark the image is. And it can be, and we talked about this in the last section, it could be overall darkness, or it could be darkness of a specific tissue type. So uh, 
one of the test questions on this last test was, you know, which tissue type uh, is easiest to penetrate? And then it went air, soft, soft tissue, specifically fat, uh, muscle, then bone, right? So those are different uh, patient densities or tissue densities that gave us different radiographic densities represented on the image. So uh, radiographic density can be overall density or it can be density of the individual tissue. So where we have contrast, we have difference in densities um, on the image receptor, difference in, in tissue densities. So what controls our contrast really again is our, our lookup table, it is our computer processing for the most part. Uh, we can have some, some minor differences in, um, you know, with, with techniques. Maybe, you might be able to see it, you might not be able to see it. Um, patient size can, can play a part as well, so we'll, we'll talk about those. So density, always darkness. Contrast is always going to be difference in density be that uh, patient density for tissue contrast, or it could be um, the uh, radiographic contrast and the density differences on the image. So spatial resolution, contrast resolution, we talked about that in the last section, spatial resolution is the actual sharpness of recorded detail. So what controls your, your spatial resolution, we're gonna really, it's gonna get a little bit tedious in, in talking about that. Um, but uh, what's going to control our spatial resolution are what we call geometric factors. So lines, planes, distances, uh, angulations, those sort of things are, are really what are going to control our sharpness of recorded detail or spatial resolution. So recorded detail, sharpness of recorded detail, uh, SRD, resolution, spatial resolution all mean the same thing. Contrast resolution is just are you able to see it? Or is there so much fog that you can't? Are there so little um, differences in the tissue types that you can't really make out the, the difference? It's there, but you just can't see it. And again, you know, I, I use that planter, right? The, the planter base, wherever that wound up. There's a different one over there. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's like if I wrote something on the board and then lowered the screen, does the screen erase what it wrote on the board? No, no it just covers it up, right? So uh, sharpness of recorded detail versus visibility. Okay, so noise, the definition of, of noise is random fluctuation of optical density. So you might see a, an image that looks real foggy and you might think, well, that, you know, it's, it's covering the whole image, right? So the whole image is fogged and it doesn't really look like a random fluctuation. It might be, but for the most part, your scatter radiation is going to lay down a, a layer of fog across the image receptor and it's just not going to look real random. It's going to look pretty uniform across the image receptor and we're going to have just a, a covering of fog. But we've also got quantum model and we talked about quantum model in the last section as well. Quantum model you know, you just break apart the word quantum, sounds like quantity, right? And then model uh, just means a, an appearance of a splotchy appearance, right? So if you've ever had a rash or anything like that, you know, uh, you can see on your skin differences in, in skin tone, right? Some places are red, some places are, are less red, uh, more pale. Um, so in that context, you've got a modely appearance. So quantum model is a modely appearance because not enough X-ray photons hit the image receptor. So in that case, you've, you've actually got, you know, those random fluctuations. You've got uh, adequate exposure, inadequate exposure, random fluctuations between the two. So we have two different types of noise. We've got uh, quantum model, and that's caused by inadequate mass. And again, there are a lot of different ways we can get to too, too little mass. And then we've got uh, um, fog, right? So types of noise, we just talked about that. The things that are gonna control your, the amount of noise and the amount of fog that we create, number one is uh, our KVP. Now, how that this really affects your image in a digital age is 
not as much as what it used to be in, in screens and films. You're still going to create the fog, right? So the fog is still going to be incident, meaning that it hits the image receptor. It's going to be on the image receptor. There are computer algorithms that, that disregard some of that exposure and get rid of some of that. So uh, it might not make it all the way into our, our final um, formulation for our, our image. So uh, anything that we can do to prevent the fog from hitting the image receptor reduces that. So that primarily is gonna be a proper KVP to, to keep the fog from being created beam limitation also to keep the fog from being created and once the, the fog is created we're going to use our grid to, to try to clean it up so scattered x-rays high kvp becomes an issue but also structure type so what kind of tissue creates most scatter radiation soft tissue right anything that's that's a water-based is going to create more uh, scatter radiation or it's better to say uh, the soft tissue is going to not only create the scatter radiation, but it's going to allow that scatter radiation to penetrate through the patient easier than bone. Because bone's going to create scatter radiation too, right? But it's more likely to absorb the scatter before it reaches the image receptor. So it doesn't become an issue on the image receptor. So, uh, you know, it's, it's creation versus transmission of the scatter to hit the image receptor. So, uh, structure type, anything that's uh, more watery is going to create more scatter radiation. Um, pathologies that increase water content will also increase scatter radiation. So if you have a patient with ascites, just full of fluid, or pleural effusion, something like that, we're going to increase uh, the amount of scatter that the patient's going to emit, uh, and it's just going to make more fog on the image receptor. So quantum model, um, again, lack of photons. What were some of the, the ways that we, uh, the, the things that compounded the problem was called quantum model. <laughs> quantum model. You remember? I, I love the way my contact just breaks off. Okay, so... Um, what happens if you want to maintain your image receptor exposure? You don't want to change your image receptor exposure, but you want to reduce patient dose. What do you do? Increase what? KVP, right. So if you increase KVP and you want to maintain image receptor dose, though, what do you do? Decrease mass, right. So mass goes down. What are the two components of mass? MAN time, right. So what's quantum model? low a mass, right? So if you increase your KVP enough and reduce your mass enough, then you could introduce quantum model. So are there tissue, or not tissue, but anatomical structures that might be more susceptible to quantum model? What do you use very low mass with? Hmm? Yeah, fingers, hands, right, toes, things like that. So could you compound the problem? Increase KVP and shoot through little bitty skinny hands? That'd make it worse, right? Uh, pediatric patients, things like that. Any kind of small, thin tissue that you use high KVP on, you introduce the, the probability that you'll increase quantum model. All right, so um, we also have a, a different type of noise we didn't have to deal with whenever we use films, and that would be electronic interference. So a lot of different things could go into electronic interference. Uh, you know, it could could be the display. You, your computer screen might be getting some electronic interference, but uh, certainly in your image system before it gets to the computer screen, you could see something too. Um, so we have in uh, CR systems. Uh, we'll walk through the steps in CR systems just, you know, so you'll understand the, the image creation CR systems. But uh, we can have, it's not really electronic interference, but we can introduce sort of like a motion artifact in the CR reader that would technically be a noise as well. 
Okay. So it's equipment related. So we just talked about all that. Uh, poor signal strength is, is what quantum model is, and you can kind of draw a, a parallel between that and, uh, you know, if, if you happen to be have like direct TV, satellite TV at home, sometimes you start to lose the signal and it, you, your picture on your TV gets kind of pixelated. Or if you, you're using, you know, a, a antenna, we don't have cable out where I am, so we use a, an antenna. And every time the wind blows, uh, we start to, to lose reception. So it's because we have poor signal strength. Or if, if you happen to be listening to the radio while you're driving, you know, long distances, you start to lose radio station. It's kind of the same thing. You lose radio station because the signal gets weak, right? So quantum model, just weak signal. You don't get the best image. that. So rules for minimizing quantum model. Uh, use enough mass, you know, in, in a nutshell. Uh, but the things that could cause you to have quantum model uh, are the, the things that we talked about, you know, too, too low mass. So you don't want to use high KVP with very thin anatomy. Um, you want to make sure that you have low enough KVP and high enough mass that you don't introduce quantum model. So um, with uh, our faster image receptors that we use in DR, that becomes a problem or potentially becomes a problem. I'll touch on that here in a second. So our, by fast image receptors, what I mean is an image receptor speed refers to how much radiation it, the image receptor needs to make a adequate exposure to give you a good image, right? So a fast image receptor is kind of like a fast, um, you're taking a picture on your phone and you've got good signal. The signal on your phone would be the light, right? So in high light, in good light, you make a, a, a take a picture and you don't have the problems that you have in low light. So in, if the light's bright enough, you get a good picture, right? And you tend to not have an issue with motion on the image, it doesn't look blurry because you weren't moving or the, the subject wasn't moving. Um, in low light though, that shutter has to stay open a little bit longer to collect enough light to get a good picture. And that's why it is that in a lot of cases, if you take a, a picture in low light, it comes out fuzzy, something was moving, okay? So in the same way of very, in the, the analogy there is the high speed is the bright light, okay? So the analogy there is that if we have high speed um, systems, then it doesn't take a, a whole lot of exposure to make a good image, okay? So if it doesn't take a whole lot of exposure to make a good image, then we can cut back on the mass, right? So if we cut back on the mass though, what do we introduce? Quantum model. So high speed image receptor systems are more susceptible to quantum model than low speed. Now I will say this though, this, that's something that you got to file away and carry it all the way through the, to the registry. Um, you might ne not ever see quantum model on an image because our image receptors are so efficient, even though they're high speed, they're so efficient um, that you might not you can experiment, but you might not be able to introduce quantum model. Had somebody trying to prove quantum model on our lab equipment the year before last, and he, he got the, the KVP as high as he could possibly get it, and the MA as high as possible. He could, could get it with a very, well, long story short, low, as low a mass as he could possibly get it. Shooting through thin, um, you know, mocked up, phantom type patient, and he couldn't introduce it. No matter what he did, he couldn't introduce it. So the image receptors are, they're sensitive enough that you might not ever truly see quantum model. Could it potentially still be an issue? And the answer is yeah. Is it still testable? The answer is definitely. Okay, so file that away, that what it is, but just know that you might not see it, all right? You might not see it in, in clinical practice. So what we want is um, 
we want as low a noise as possible. So we want to eliminate as much scatter radiation as possible. We want to eliminate quantum model, which we should be able to do, to do uh, through manipulation of our, our technique. Use a low enough KVP and a high enough mass to not have that issue, even on fast image receptors. So fast image receptors historically have been high noise, uh, low spatial resolution, but that's just not the, the case so much anymore. So KVP we already talked about and its role in quantum model. So uh, again, uh, fast image receptor speeds have high noise, traditionally have had high, high noise, uh, low spatial resolution and uh, contrast resolution as well. High spatial resolution, contrast resolution require low noise, and so low noise accomplishes or accompanies slower image receptors traditionally. So um, that just might not be the case anymore. Uh, maybe it's just our image receptors in the lab, but it uh, might not be the case anymore. So um, <clears throat> KVP, uh, just for historical context. KVP used to control our scatter, it still controls our scatter radiation, but it used to control our contrast directly. And what it does, and it's still applicable, is as we increase KVP, our differential absorption goes down. So that if you got to a KVP level high enough, you would penetrate all tissue types at the same rate, and your contrast would suffer from it. Uh, those KVP rates don't don't really exist on, on normal diagnostic equipment. You'd have to go up very, very high uh, in order to, to really, really prove that, to get to the point of penetration on all tissue types equally, right? So high KVP uh, was traditionally low contrast, even within the diagnostic range. If you shot a KUB, for example, with very high KVP, then uh, you might not be able to see the kidneys, you might not be able to see the psoas muscles, any of that stuff, right? So the reason I say this historical context is because if you shot a KUB with high KVP now, 100 KVP in digital processing, uh, the computer algorithm is gonna make it look like you shot it with 80 KVP for the most part, okay? So historical context, KVP is what we use to control contrast. Higher KVP, more penetration, uh, our differential absorption went down and we lost contrast. Don't see that so much anymore. All right, screen speed uh, really is not a thing anymore. Film speed, not a thing anymore. So we're just gonna skip through those. Sensitometry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what a H and D curve looks like because there are still some uh, characteristics of the H and D curve that we can see. So the, the things, the portions of H and D curve, and I'll show you one uh, here in just a minute. The portions of the H and D curve are the shoulder, the straight line portion, and the toe. So I'm gonna go ahead and exit this and go down to the H and D curve that is right here, okay? So H and D curve is what, or characteristic curve, H and D curve uh, stands for Herter and Dryfield, and it's a, a curve it's a exposure response curve that we kind of borrowed from photography. Okay, so what we have in the H and D curve is we've got a, you know, it's two planes. So we've got optical density relative to the exposure. So as exposure goes up, then optical density used to go up, right? Um, so if we overexpose the patient, we could reasonably expect our optical density to be very high. Your indication that you've got overexposure now, of course, is your index number, right? Not your overall density. So if you underexpose the patient, then your optical density would be very low, right? So what we've got is three different portions. We've got the shoulder portion, we've got the straight line portion, we've got the toe portion. Toe portion represents very low exposure. Shoulder portion represents very high exposure, really outside of the diagnostic range. And where we live is pretty much in the, in the straight line portion, okay? So 
uh, where we still see the H and D curve is in comparison, or not really comparison, but in description, let's say, of our lookup table. All right, so if you could get into the computer system and look deeply enough into the computer system, like a super user or whatever, then for every computer algorithm that you have, you would see an H and D curve, okay? Because a computer algorithm, most people can't, I can't make sense out of them. You know, what does a wide lookup table mean compared to a narrow lookup table? I, you know, I don't know. But I can look at this and tell you, okay? So what this tells us is really contrast. That straight line portion tells us uh, the relative speed of the image receptor, which is constant now. Um, you only have one image receptor. So it tells us the speed of the image receptor, but it also tells us the contrast that we're looking at. All right, so if we have an H and D curve that's assigned to a lookup table that has a very vertical straight line portion, this portion right here, that vertical portion means that you see how steep it is, right? So for the exposure from uh, roughly one, that'd be like 1.3, but we're gonna say 1.5 to 1.8, look how much of a change happened in our density. It went from right here to way up here. So it went from very close to minimum exposure to very close to maximum exposure. Minimum exposure, we got great differences in density. Okay, what does difference in density mean? Contrast. Contrast, right. So a little bit of exposure, and we got a big difference in density. As opposed to if our, uh, if our curve was like this, in the same range, to get that much density difference between the two, here's 1.5, and to get to, one, to, to get to that level of density, look how much more exposure I would have to have. Okay, so when I'm going from minimum to maximum density really, really fast, that would be high contrast. Does that make sense? But if it takes me a lot of, a lot of exposure to get from minimum to maximum density, that's going to take our levels of contrast, our numbers of, of uh, grayscales, our, our number of gray steps, that's going to spread it out over a much broader area. Does that kind of make sense? So high contrast, low contrast. So again, if you were to look up in your, uh, in your computer system and see the H and D curves that are representative of your lookup tables, what you'd be looking at here is extremity work. Right? Very vertical, because you want to see high contrast and extremity work. Chest x-ray is going to be more like that. Okay. Right, so the H and D curve or the characteristic curve is still applicable in that context. Um, we actually used to have to plot and uh, we used the H and D curve to, to determine how, uh, how exhausted the um, processor chemistry was. All right, so we, we have to, to take some images and we'd have to plot the, you know, the, the contrast. And if it started losing contrast, if our, a processor started giving us images that, that gave us a very horizontal uh, H&D curve that would indicate that our, our uh, processor chemistry is exhausted and needed to be replaced. You don't have to do that anymore. So you're not gonna have to learn to draw the H&D curve, but you need to recognize that a very vertical curve means high contrast. A very horizontal curve means low contrast. And we'll, I'll kind of show you what, um, a low curve and a high curve really kind of look like later. Okay. If I can get back to the little word, we're going to look at that again here later on. Okay, so it measures speed, contrast, latitude is really grayscale. Processing issues when we use processors um, and possibly reciprocity failure, reciprocity failure um, would be uh, because of you know the, the speed issues. All right, so speed, we talked about that. Speed is the sensitivity. All right, so when you see a, a question about uh, image receptor speed, think sensitivity. 
All right, so sensitivity, if you're very sensitive to something, how much of something can you take before, you know, you're done? Like now? No. Not, not much. much, not much, right. So very sensitive means it doesn't, doesn't need a whole lot. So doesn't need a whole lot of exposure. That means it's fast, okay? So if, uh, if you have something slow speed, low speed, then it means you need a lot of exposure. So when you're comparing two different image receptor systems, high speed means it doesn't need a whole lot of exposure. Low speed means that it, it needs quite a bit. So what if you made an exposure on high speed system with a low speed technique? What's the end result gonna be? Underexposure or overexposure? Mm -hmm. Greatly overexposed, right. So if you're comparing two systems and it says which one's more likely to give you quantum model? High speed. High speed, right. Because with the high speed, what would you do if you didn't want to overexpose a patient? Well, no, 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 we're, yes is, is a short answer. That's in your technique, but in, okay, so put away technique for, for right now. So you made exposure on low speed, then you switched to high speed. What would you need to do? Yeah, you, you kind of mouthed it, but you, you lower your mass. Exactly, you reduce your mass. Uh, technique correction is, most of the time, is going to be decreased mass, right? So. We're gonna reduce the mass, but that might introduce what problem? Quantum model, potentially, right. So uh, let's approach it from a different direction and say you're selecting between a couple of different techniques. KVP is the same, mass is the same. No, let's see. I'm trying to come up with a scenario on the spot. Oh, okay, let's kind of walk into it. So you're selecting uh, which image receptor system is going to give you a lower dose. You would select high speed, high speed because you can reduce your mass, right? So if you're selecting between techniques that are going to give you the highest exposure, KVP is the same, mass is the same, then what would you select? Higher speed, right? Um, Okay, so what if one, uh, uh, I won't get too deep into numbers right now. So um, <clears throat> that was going to give you a more complicated one, but I, I think I'll save that. <laughs> we'll maybe look at that later on. All right. So optical density, overall blackening in the image or darkening in the image, high density equals a very dark image, all con controlled really by your computer algorithm. Um, where you might have some, some issues with contrast and density now are places that we never saw it before, right? So, uh, I think I touched on this in chapter 15. If you have a situation where you under collimate and you leave your image receptor um, or your collimation open, right? Under collimate, you... Uh, decrease collimation, then you have a lot of exposure to the image receptor, direct exposure to the image receptor, right? Follow me? So in your computer algorithm, your application of computer algorithm, it's gotta take all that dense area and it's gotta consider that, that, that you actually meant to include that, all that information. And in reconstruction of the image and trying to apply your histogram to the, to the lookup table, you might lose some contrast. Um, your index number might also indicate that you're overexposed the patient, even if you use the proper technique, because it's gonna look at all that direct exposure, all that dark area on the image, all that black area on the image, and it's gonna say you overexposed the patient, even if you did not, right? And in reconstruction, you may lose some contrast and you, uh, you know, the, the density, the overall density of the image might, uh, uh, might suffer, right? Or you may have too much density or not enough density, one of the two, even if you use proper technique. So image receptor exposure is really what we're gonna substitute for the most part for density. 
Density is really controlled by the computer algorithm. Your technique is not going to, to, to sufficiently affect your density that we really need to consider it that much. Your indication that you've got too much exposure, which would be density, is that you've, you know, you look at your, your, um, your index number and that's gonna be your indication, right? So every time you see density, if you see density, just think image receptor exposure. It means the same thing in this context. So what's gonna control your image receptor exposure? Pretty much everything. KVP, SID, OID, to a lesser degree, and we'll talk about that later. Tissue thickness, tissue density, pathology. Is it additive pathology? Is it destructive pathology? Filtration, grid use, everything is, is going to go into um, the, the overall exposure to the image receptor and control and affect your index number. Okay? Any questions?